Namaste. Hi there, I'm Nero Karanha with Our Daily Planet, and today we're really thrilled to have Senator Martin Heinrich from New Mexico with us. Senator, we wanted to ask you a little bit about, firstly, New Mexico's record as a clean energy leader. In the past 10 years, you've really emerged as one of the states that's moving forward with renewables, with solar, with wind. And I wanted to ask, how can the rest of the country perhaps learn from New Mexico how we balance these projects and the ecosystems on which they're built? For example, how do we ensure, you know, solar farms aren't degrading parts of really precious desert ecosystem and so on? Well, I'm really proud of the shift that New Mexico has begun to make. We went from being pretty recalcitrant on energy issues to really leaning in and setting goals for our power sector of completely eliminating carbon in our generation of electricity. But the details always really matter. You know, we're a state with a lot of beautiful public lands, a lot of important cultural landscapes. So getting siding right for something like wind or solar, 90% of the battle is really knowing the communities and the landscapes so that you're not inherently trying to build conflict into any sort of development. As you said, where you put a solar field or where you put a wind farm makes an enormous difference. And we have big migrations, waterfowl, of raptors in our state. And if you put a wind farm in the wrong place, you're asking for trouble. So getting those details right at the front end and engaging with communities so you're not surprised, those things make a giant difference. We've seen a lot of backlash in the last few years over, for example, putting solar in agricultural areas. And I think we're learning now to do things like agrivoltaics. I think you'll see more of in the future where you do see agriculture and renewable energy mix. They work together rather than canceling one or the other out. I want to change topics for a minute to the thing that's top of mind for a lot of Americans today in the environmental world, which is the wildfires in the West and the oppressive heat that the Southwest and parts of the West have been experiencing over the past few months. I wondered what you would say to President Trump and conservatives who deny that these events are worse now than ever because of climate change. And are you surprised that President Trump hasn't said a word about these devastating wildfires that are ravaging the entire West Coast? I wish I could say I'm surprised surprised that the president hasn't said a word. What I've learned over the last four years is this is someone who views the entirety of the world through the lens of what he needs at any given moment. But I spend a lot of time trying to have conversations with conservatives broadly. I do think among my Republican colleagues, there's a desire right now to find a way to get right on climate and to find a way to talk about the climate crisis that resonates with conservatives. And I think they're really struggling to do that, but they're honestly trying to do that. We may have some real progress in the coming weeks, I'm hopeful, on the Kigali Agreement and on dealing with something that could represent a very substantial amount of warming that we could take off the table if we can come to some agreement on phasing out some of these chemicals that frankly our domestic manufacturers are going to make the replacements for. So it should be a natural fit for conservatives to say, I'm fighting for these companies, these manufacturers who are going to make the future of this and we're going to set the bar for the world. And yet that's not quite where they've been for the last few years. I think we may be turning a corner on that issue if we can do that, maybe we can start to make some real progress on renewable storage, decarbonizing transportation, and all the other things we need to do to really get a handle on a very unstable climate. Senator, following up on that, you were a recent co-sponsor of the Senate Clean Economy Act of 2020, which serves as a legislative roadmap for climate action that Democrats would undertake should they win back the Senate this fall. And I wanted to ask, what would climate action on the scale mean for Western states like New Mexico that are really feeling the effects of climate change disproportionately? Well, I think it gives us all hope that we can pass the kind of natural resource birthright that our kids should have onto them in a way that really respects the fact that we haven't led up till now nearly as effectively as we should. And one of the points of having that legislation was to sort of put out all those pieces that can get us to a more responsible future, knowing full well that many of them will not be enacted at the federal level immediately bipartisanship is sort of baked into how the Senate works. And so we're doing everything we can to kind of try to lay the groundwork
core and the foundation for successful climate action. We've gotten it wrong enough times that my hope is we're doing everything we can to find that path forward and to recognize that we have to start treating all communities, especially those disproportionately impacted by these things, with the sort of dignity and, and respect that they deserve and recognize that our current set of policies, even the policy solutions that many of us were pushing five years ago, did not adequately address those issues. There's been a huge increase in federal oil and gas leasing under President Trump and a disregard, frankly, for sacred sites like Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about why Chaco Canyon is so important, so special to the people of your state. And do you think that we need to do as much leasing as we are now in order to maintain our energy independence? Chaco Canyon, to take a step back, it's, it's such an important cultural site that it's recognized worldwide as one of the great religious and cultural sites on earth. If you visit it, it, and especially if you're able to visit it in the company of people who have a living cultural relationship to it. When I invited Secretary Bernhardt to come out and see Chaco Canyon, one of the reasons why I think we made some progress there is that Governor Bayo of the Pueblo of Acoma walked with him and described to him how this relates to his life and his family today. It may be a very old cultural site, but those relationships with New Mexico's tribes are just as alive today as they have ever been. You can't take that walk and not have some appreciation for how much that place needs to be protected. We have to recognize that there are global economic changes that are occurring. Even if you don't believe in climate change, and to me as an engineer, the writing's been on the wall, climate change since at least the late 70s, if not earlier. But if you don't believe that, you should recognize the economic ramifications of not planning for the economic changes that are that are coming to the world. We have to start planning for the clean economy and how we're going to provide education and do all of those critical services for our people without relying on fossil fuels to do that. And the time to do that is now. And Senator, I wanted to follow up on a couple points you just made, mainly the fact that you're an engineer by training. And I wanted to ask, how has your background shaped your views on renewable energy and energy independence? Because you've been ahead of the curve on these issues, you know, since your time as a council member in Albuquerque? Well, I think I got an appreciation for this stuff. Even before I went to college, my dad was a utility lineman. So I used to go to his uh, office after school and draw pictures of Ready Kilowatt, which was like the, the little cartoon figure on the side of his truck when I was in elementary school. And I, I watched how he worked and how the utility industry worked at that time. And then I went to college and I joined a team that tried to build a effectively did build a carbon fiber solar car back in 1992, 1993. It made me realize that all of this stuff works from an engineering perspective. Solar panels worked, LED light bulbs worked, regenerative braking worked at that time in the early 90s, and yet none of that stuff was in the commercial market. And it made me realize that we didn't have an engineering problem, we had an economic problem. We just need to make those things cheaper. And today, you know, you look at solar and wind and you realize that they're cheaper than the traditional incumbent sources of energy. I think we've won the generation war for how to decarbonize electricity. Now we need to address storage, seasonal storage, transportation, industrial processes. And all of those things have solutions today. Some of those solutions are not economic yet, but we need the policies in place at the state level and at the federal level to, to drive those things to where they're actually cheaper than the traditional incumbent technologies. One of the things that you have been instrumental in in the past few months is the passage of the Great American Outdoors Act. I know you're a dad and you've thought about it that way as someone who is trying to pass on the legacy of our parks to future generations. Talk about what that bill means to you, to our country, and how you overcame some of the Republican opposition to the bill 
Bill, because that was not easy. And getting it over the goal line took a huge effort. When I think about what makes me who I am, so many of the memories that I have are of myself with either my wife and or our kids in America's public land. And when I came to Congress, there was effectively a war on public lands. There was an effort to divest of federal public lands, to sell them off, to develop them. And that's really turned around in the last 10 years. I'm really proud of the progress that we have made because in a time when clearly the public understands how divided we are in Washington, D.C., this was something that brought Republicans and Democrats together. Now, I don't want to make it sound like there wasn't opposition. There actually was an enormous amount of opposition. In a normal bill that we would pass through the Senate might take um, three days. It took us closer to two weeks with this legislation because there were certain members who would raise any procedural hurdle they could, hoping that things would kind of fall apart. It makes me optimistic that something that was really quite hard and divided and partisan 10 years ago, that we were able to pull together and do something great for the next generation. I ask Thank one more quick question. Oh, yeah. What's the skull behind you on your shelf? I've been looking oh, at this whole see. interview and I've been are staring looking, at it. Are you looking at yeah. this one? So that's a coyote. It was a roadkill. This is yes. a javelina, which wow. uh, javelinas only live in Arizona, Texas, and New Mexico. Awesome. Cool. <laughs> that's very so that up. cool. Thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. We know you're busy. Congress is back. You have lots on your plate. And we appreciate all the time you've given to us today. Wish you the best of luck with the rest of the session.